Hello, and welcome to another episode of the PR Report. I'm your host, Pleb Rising. Today we have episode nine going over chapter nine of The Sovereign Individual, Mastering the Transition to the Information Age. The title of chapter nine is Nationalism, Reaction, and the New Luddites. I'm going to start off by look, taking a look at a historical example to put things in context, which talks about, they're using this as a way to give an example of a deliberate and decisive break from the norm from another time in history where this has happened. They reach back about 500 years ago into the early 16th century, so around the 1520s, when the church essentially had universal authority over everybody in Europe. And at that time, there was rising sentiment going against the church. People were starting to speak out about it. And it was a very dangerous thing to do that. If you were going to speak out and challenge the church's authority, you took on some risk with that. You could risk injury. You could risk your life, actually. They were burning a lot of people at the stake at the time, publicly executing heretics to make examples out of them. If you spoke ill of the church, you could have your tongue cut out. So it was definitely a risky activity to engage in to speak out against the church. And those were deterrents that the church employed to try to dissuade people from doing so. But those ultimately, those deterrents would fail. And part of the reason for that is the advent of the printing press, which had, was gaining popularity over the last several decades at that time. Again, we're talking about the early 1600s or early 16th century in Europe. And what the printing press, as that was picking up steam, allowed to happen was proliferation of heretical arguments. And the church saw it as heresy. The people printing these things and challenging their their, their authority didn't really seem this way. They were having different ideologies. So ideologies across the population were changing. And this was characterized by the Reformation that was taking place around that time. You had individuals like Martin Luther publicly posting statements against the church for everybody to see. So it was a pretty exciting time. But the point of bringing this up is that that situation in Europe at that time in the early 1600s is an example of a deliberate and decisive break from the norm. And one of the things that they follow up with that is there's something similar to that in their mind, the author's mind happening right now in terms of all the nation states of the world at the close of the millennium and they're facing a similar situation. It's not the printing press that is challenging the status quo, rather these microprocessing based technological advances. And again, this goes back to the theme of the book, which we introduced and dug into in the first episode going over chapter one, which is the new revolution of power, liberating individuals at the expense of the 20th century nation state. This new revolution of power are these microprocessing based technological advances. And as they have gained steam over the last several decades, began transitioning human society into the information age. And that's been going on for the last several decades. And we're in that transition right now, becoming more and more in the information age as each day passes. So one of the things that these technological advances are bringing to go along with that example of the church is this discontinuity. It's a decisive and deliberate break with, with a norm. And from a high level, this can be characterized by changes in economic organization of the kind described in previous chapters. We talked about this, about the emergence of the cyber economy, the make politics of the information age, the triumph of efficiency over power. Those were episodes six and seven, respectively. We have a more or less rapid fall off in importance of all organizations that operate within rather than beyond geographic boundaries. Examples like this would be governments, labor unions, licensed professionals, lobbyists, people that are geographically bound in their trade or profession. We have a wider recognition that the nation state is obsolete, leading to widespread secession movements in many parts of the globe. This isn't really happening yet, or we haven't seen too much of this happening now, but this is, we could probably see something like this happening in the U.S. if you look at like Texas or maybe Florida, possibly Alaska, just because it's so far away. I also was, was thinking a little bit about El Salvador and what's going on in Central America right now. Now, they're obviously their own nation state, but they're a much smaller country, a much smaller sovereignty. And, but they're really making some headway in terms of being progressive on the international scene and breaking ties, thumbing their noses at the IMF, adopting the Bitcoin standard, 
and doing some really progressive things that caught the attention of the world. And it strikes me as an example of one of these smaller jurisdictions leading the way and being an interesting example of how a nation state could not only operate, but just transform and move into the future. It's also a decline in the status of traditional elites, as well as a decline in the respect accorded the symbols and beliefs that justify the nation state. An intense and even violent nationalist reaction centered among those who lose status, income, and power when what they consider to be their, quote, ordinary life is disrupted by political devolution and new market arrangements. So some of the characteristics of that might be that people are suspicious of or opposed to globalization, free trade, quote, foreign ownership, services and activities entering their local economy that they're not used to, that they might find threatening. There might be hostility to immigration. There was a prediction that it'll become popular to hate on the, quote, information elite, these people that are taking advantage of this new environment to operate and generate wealth and become autonomous, self-sovereign individuals. They're basically the winners. We have some pushback on them, people that are rich or have a lot of wealth, pushback on people that are well-educated, pushing back on capital flights or anything perceived as moving capital away from one's homeland, and disappearing jobs. Also a resurgence. We could see a resurgence of nationalism with violent tendencies to reinforce states' claims on people and their resources. Possibly neo-Luddite attacks on successful sovereign individuals from those who are losing out or have lost out. We were just talking about up here. We'll dig into this more a little bit towards the end. Previous nationalistic imperatives lose appeal. Information age gives way to a new consciousness of identity, new morality, and complementary ideologies. So that grip of a nationalistic identity or nationalism or people having one's identity tied to their homeland is going to loosen up a little bit. They also predicted nationalist reaction to peak in the early decades of the 21st century. So that's essentially right now. And they expected fragmented sovereignties by this point to already be demonstrating better efficiency. Don't think we've quite seen that, but there's definitely pieces being moved on the chessboard, so to speak. Texas is doing a lot of progressive things right now. Again, I think Florida is, but we don't haven't we haven't seen any major noteworthy breakaways yet. Although those those may be on the horizon. We'll just have to see. And ultimately, we'll see the collapse of the nation state due to fiscal crisis. There's a lot of fiscal crisis. There's a bunch of there's definitely a crisis happening right now fiscally whether or not that's only fueled by technology. I don't think that's the case. As I mentioned in a previous video, out of the four broad categories of mega politics that the authors define as a way to analyze these movements and the change in the logic of violence, they are climate, typology, technology, and microbes. This book was written in mind, or this book was written in the sense of considering technology as being the only major make a political factor at play. But that's not the case because right now we have three out of those four in play with climate, technology, and microbes with the COVID virus and all that. But there's definitely problems internationally on the economic front. So zooming in to this idea of nation states of the world at the close of the millennium facing a similar situation of there being a deliberate and decisive break with the norm and that bringing discontinuities looking at it from the looking at it from the perspective of the individual they describe this transition into this information age as the denationalization of the individual and there's a lot of points they made here so I'm going to try to go through and touch on each one of these but they talk about citizenship becoming less attractive and tenable they pointed out that Citizens of nation states, modern day nation states, are constantly exposed to a barrage of banal messages in the routines of daily life designed to reinforce your identification with your local nation state, which makes sense. We all grew up, at least growing up in the West, you, anytime you go to a sporting event anywhere, they play the national anthem, things like this. Or if you went to public schools as a kid, you most likely recited the Pledge of Allegiance and sang a song every day. So, they're pointing out that we grow up 
with these reinforcement mechanisms all around us that helps solidify this national identity and that these are going to be going away. They also talk about the emergence of what they call narrow casting to replace broadcasting, which is essentially what we've experienced over the last 10, 20 years on the internet with customized news feeds, Twitter type services, etc. We'll also see the privatization of education facilitated by technology. And this has been a really big thing in the internet the last 15 or so years. If you would just happen to Google best online learning, you would see hundreds of results. There's tons of companies operating in this space currently, and there's lots of great opportunities to learn. But one of the coolest things in my mind about education being privatized is that not only is it being privatized, but there's really great opportunities to learn tons of cool things for free. And the best example that I know of about that is the Sailor Academy. I put a link right here. It's learn.sailor.org. But they're basically free and open online courses to anyone who wants to learn pretty much anything from technology to art history, just ton, tons of courses. It's a really great resource and it's 100% free. So if you got the time and you're motivated to learn about something, there's no excuse not to. It's not that you don't have an opportunity to do it. You just have to decide that you want to go do it and dig in. It's pretty amazing. There's also a thing called Khan Academy that's been around for a while as well. I think the Sailor Academy started in 2008. Khan Academy has been around for a while. And they're also free, but if you go to their website, they just immediately hit you up for a donation. So it's free, but they bug you about it. Not to say that that takes away from it. It's just a little bit different experience. Point being, there is tons of unique, forward-thinking, progressive educational opportunities in play right now due to the internet, which is pretty awesome. They also talk about nationalism will not be constantly massaged into every corner of the mind's life, which ties back into being exposed to these mechanisms that reinforce national identity. Commerce transcending locality, same with jobs. Talked about that in some previous videos. This quote was pretty great. The building blocks of the cyber economy, cyber money, cyber banking, and an unregulated global cyber market in securities are almost bound to come into existence on a large scale. As they do, the capacity of greedy governments to confiscate wealth of its, quote, citizens will shrivel. See this playing out every day right now. There's a lot of debate going on with U.S. monetary policy in the fiat world. It's being challenged not only by crypto, but mostly by Bitcoin, which proponents of see as the first true sound money to ever be invented. This is a really interesting time on that front. While the leading states will no doubt attempt to enforce a cartel to preserve high taxes and fiat money by cooperating to limit encryption and prevent citizens from escaping their domains, the states will ultimately fail. Again, this kind of goes back to what we're seeing play out every day since the pandemic started in March 2020. It's December of 2021, so it was about 18, 19 months ago. The U.S. has printed what, three or four trillion dollars, something like 40 percent of all U.S. Def USD fiat like in existence today has been printed since the pandemic started. So there's a lot of shifting going on on this front. But they say the most productive people on the planet will find their way to economic freedom. So they're not going to be held back just because these technological advances are breaking down barriers physically, but also financially and economically. And people aren't geographically bound and can domicile not only their lives, but their economic activities anywhere they choose, essentially. It's easier to move around the world and live and work. And so if you know some place where you can go live and work and it's cheaper and you think you can live a better life there, the barrier to do that is as low as it's ever been. And it's unlikely that the state will even be effective at keeping people penned up where they can be physically held to ransom. Governments in the industrial era priced their services on the basis of the success of the taxpayer rather than in relation to the cost or value of any services provided. Innovators vilified revival of nationalist sentiment. And again, we'll talk more about this with the Luddites example towards the end. A couple of quotes from the end of this section that drive this point home are the wealthy OECD countries impose heavy tax and regulatory burdens upon individuals doing business with, within their borders. These costs have been tolerable when the OECD nation states were the only jurisdictions in which one could do business and reside at a reasonable level of comfort. That day has passed. The premium paid to be taxed and regulated as a resident of the richest nation states no longer repays its cost. It will be ever less tolerable as competition between jurisdictions intensifies. 
those with the earnings ability and capital to meet the competitive challenges of the information age will be able to locate anywhere and do business anywhere. With the choice of domiciles, only the most patriotic or stupid will continue to reside in high-tax countries. And again, that kind of digs in or drives the point home of what we were just talking about, where the barrier to operate and live and be anywhere in the world is as low as it's ever been. And so if you have the ways and means, if you're smart enough to contribute, provide value, innovate, add to this emerging economy, you're going to be rewarded. And one of those rewards is not just monetarily or wealth. It's within the ability to go anywhere and be anywhere in the world and be valuable when you're doing so. So these, quote, legions of losers, those that are left behind, will respond to developments that undermine the nation state with the fury of hunter-gatherers protecting their families. In an environment where disoriented and alienated individuals will have increased power to disrupt and destroy, backlash against the information economy could prove to be violent and unpleasant. This is just talking about anytime things are changing, the people that those changes affect adversely, they're not going to like it. If you got a good thing going on, and all of a sudden it goes away and your livelihood's affected, of course you're not going to like that. It's pretty easy to see that connection, but they're just, they're formally laying this out being like, there's going to be a pushback, not exactly how or sure, but they see it as possibly being violent and or unpleasant. Another quote from the book here is that this loss of power by nation states is a logical consequence of the advent of low-cost advanced computational capacity. Again, that ties back into the theme of the book, this new revolution of power. It's liberating individuals at the expense of the 20th century nation state. This revolution of power is the advent of the low cost advanced computational capacity. They continue, microprocessing both reduces returns to violence and creates for the first time a competitive market for the protection services for which governments charge monopoly prices in the industrial period. Again, we talked about this in some of the previous videos. But one of the main services provided by these nation states was protection of what? Protection of your life, protection of your property. And in exchange for that protection, that service that the government or the nation state provided you, you paid for that service. How did you pay for that service? Through taxation, through inflation of your currency, et cetera. Continuing on, another quote from the book. The most violent of the terrorists of the early decades of the new millennium will not be homeless paupers, but displaced workers who formerly enjoyed middle-class incomes and status. We just touched on this, but again, they're driving that point home. And they have a couple of examples of this. And the main example was citing the Luddites in 1812 over in England in the West Yorkshire area. Now, there was... A group of people called croppers, I guess. I had to look this up because I, I wasn't familiar with the term. But there's a group of people called croppers, and they perform this manual labor. And that manual labor performed by the croppers was replaced by automated cropping machines. And so guess what? The people whose lives depended on being croppers that got replaced by the machines, they got mad and rampaged throughout the countryside, raged and burned all these factories that were popping up that were putting them out of business. And we're murdering the owners that adopted this new technology because they're they pushing back on it. They don't like it. And this is a really good example of technology coming in, making things more efficient and easier to operate on, and people pushing back on it. These are the Luddites. They pointed out that the cropping machine that was the innovation at that time that was introduced into the industry took 18 hours to do what a person using hand shears would do in 88 hours. So what one person could do in 88 hours, which is roughly two full weeks of employment in modern, from a modern perspective, 40 hour work weeks. So two full weeks of employment with a little bit of overtime distilled into 18 hours, essentially three, three and a half days. Pretty amazing. And there's also another example of technology being introduced in the same area at the same time that went relatively unnoticed or was not challenged. And this was by a gentleman, spearheaded by a gentleman named William Cook, who apparently introduced a carpet weaving machinery innovation into industry in the area. And nobody cared. Why? 
because carpets were a product in which humans had yet to specialize in that area, at least in England at that time. I don't know if carpet machinery was, humans were specializing carpet anywhere in the world at that time, maybe in India or something like that. But in that area, that was a new introduction into industry, into the economy, new innovation, new jobs, new everything. And it didn't displace anybody who depended on doing something by hand. And so that went unnoticed and nobody pushed back on it. So these violent tendencies that people will have in similar to how the Luddites behaved in the early 19th century in England there, the authors are pointing out that they expect to see forms of that emerging here in the, 20, in the first few decades of the 21st century. There'll be a rise of anarchic conditions. And just to do a quick review, I think everybody has a notion of what anarchy is, but the definition is the organization of society on the basis of voluntary cooperation without political institutions or hierarchical government. It sounds pretty cool. And for anarchy to be sustained requires that resources be predictable and defendable. And digital resources may prove to be predictable in the information age. And the quote from the author says, if digital money can be transferred anywhere on the planet at the speed of light, which it can, it's literally happening right now, conquest of the territory in which a cyber bank is incorporated may be a waste of time. See, so this gets back to this decreasing returns on violence, which is the whole point of this book of these authors developing their mega political analysis so they can analyze technology, climate, microbes, topology to tease out those hidden factors of change that alter the logic of violence. And again, the logic of violence is the rising and falling costs and returns on violence. And so what's happening now is that as we come out of the 20th century, out of this industrial era where that was categorized by increasing returns on violence. So like the more brute force you had, the more money you put into your resources to make the biggest army, you got a bigger return on that investment. Those days are over. Returns on violence are falling in the digital age. And so what they're saying is that's upending everything. It's going to change our economy. It's going to change how people work, all this stuff. And so if something, what they call digital money, which is essentially Bitcoin right now, but there's a lot of other cryptos that are vying to be vying to be players in that space. But essentially, if digital money can be transferred anywhere on the planet at the speed of light, again, which it can, the conquest of the territory in which a cyber bank is incorporated may be a waste of time. Nation states wishing to suppress sovereign individuals would have to see simultaneously both the world's banking havens and its data havens. Even then, if encrypted systems are designed properly, nation states would merely be able to sabotage or destroy certain sums of digital money, not seize it. And this is the case with Bitcoin right now on Earth. It's encrypted, it's impenetrable, it's stood up to attacks over um, the last 11 or 12 years, however long it's been in existence. And every time it gets attacked, it gets funded by a government, any of these things that are designed to break it down, make it go away, it comes back stronger. So I think... The fact that the authors in some of the previous chapters predicted the rise of cyber currencies or what they called cyber currencies or cyber money isn't it wasn't it wasn't hard to see that coming, I think. But looking at it in this way, it peels back a couple layers on the onion, so to speak, and starts to shed light on why it's so important and how these things like encryption and data privacy come into play in terms of the economy. And that's going to do it for this episode of the PR Report. Thanks for listening, everybody. And we'll be back in the next episode going over Chapter 10.